We are now going to turn to our passage this morning, and it's an important passage, it's a significant passage, not to say that other passages aren't significant, they are, but it's an important passage for us to focus on, and that's what we're doing. Chapter 4, so if you have a Bible, of course, turn to it. If you do not have a Bible, there's one in front of you in the pew, and you're going to go to page 1013, 1013, or Philippians chapter 4 that God will continue to speak to us, okay? So we're in Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 8 and 9. I'm going to read it in the entirety, and then we're going to circle back, and we're going to focus on a number of things in this passage. So here we go. It says, Now finally, both brothers and sisters, whatever is true and whatever is noble, whatever is right and whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Please highlight that if you can in your device or in your Bible. Verse 9, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, this is the Apostle Paul talking or seen in me, put these things into practice. And here's the promise. And the God of peace will be with you. Okay. So, this passage, and again, this section of the book of Philippians, as most of Paul's books near the end is heavy application. We are in that section. And Paul is saying and all of the stuff that he has been communicating in this letter to a Philippian church and also to us, he's saying, now, this is the last thing that I want you to understand. He says, finally. And then he gives us a list of things where he wants us to think about. So the first thing I want us to recognize is the power of your thoughts. The truth is that what we think about will shape our attitudes, will shape our actions, and ultimately will shape our lives. What we think about indeed shapes who we are. Are. Proverbs 23 7, depending on your version, will say something like this For as a person thinks within their selves, so they are. Or as for as he or she thinks within himself or herself, so that person is. That is a loaded statement. And when I think about thoughts, I think about a seed, right? A thought is like a seed. Now, we're familiar with this planet and the dirt and knowing that if you take a certain seed and you plant it into the soil and if it is watered, if it's well cared for, if the soil is a a good place, that seed will sprout and it will sprout roots. And if you can go to the next slide, please, there should be an image of this hopefully, there it is, that seed will sprout roots, and then it'll start to shoot up whatever is contained within that seed. And given enough time, whatever is in that seed will develop. In this case, we have an apple tree, right? It is by no accident, and it helps me to think about that in the Bible, it talks about that we were made from dirt, okay? Don't read too much into that, but what helps me is that our soul is like soil, and what we put into our mind, what we put into our heart, what we allow to be there in time will take root and develop into something. So if we put things like that are true and that are lovely and are admirable, if we put them into our heart, think about them, make room for them, we'll see the fruit of those things in our life. 
Now, if you're a gardener, you know that there are other things that grow in a garden that you don't want. What are those called? Weeds. I hate weeds. Sometimes I walk around here and I notice a weed. By the way, if you like to pull weeds, I have a great place for you to do that. Why is it that weeds grow so readily without any attention and the things you want, be it cucumbers or be it flowers, take a lot of attention, right? We have to garden our own soul. Now hear me, right? You are the watcher in some regards of what you put in here, what you put in here. And what you allow to live in your thought life, what you allow to be inside of your heart will eventually show itself. If you recognize in your life that you have poisonous weeds of anger or greed or envy or pride or whatever, these things are coming from something inside of you. However, if you choose by the Spirit of God to think about what the Word of God tells us, what's pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy, put these things into the soil of your, start, of your, your soul. You will see good things come out, things that are true and that are lovely and that are admirable, the fruit of the Spirit living in our life. Paul knows, God knows, and hopefully you know the power of your thoughts, what you think about, and they will indeed grow into something. So this is why we must be diligent and careful what we plant in the soil of our soul. What you think about, what you watch, what you read, what you scroll through on on Instagram or wherever it is, everything communicates to us. And Paul in Scripture says that there's some things there that will bear fruit that are good, and there's some things that are bear fruit that are not good. And you and I have a responsibility to garden our own soul. Your thoughts are powerful. That is what you think about because they will grow. Now, the second thing I want us to think about is the power of your focus. So we know that thoughts are powerful, and now we get narrower still to think, what do you focus on? And Paul gives us a clear guideline of what to focus on. And by the way, it's not just merely a guideline, it's a command. This is not optional for Christians, nor is it something that only super Christians do. Every person can benefit from what you focus on. He says, think about these things. So we must do this. What are we planting? And he goes on, I'm going to read it one more time. Finally, brothers, sisters, I want you to focus on this, whatever is true. And we're going to break this down in just a bit. I want you to focus in on whatever is noble, whatever is right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Think about such things. So this should be like a filter for what you allow to go into your heart and mind. Have you ever seen a a sifter? You know what sifters are? Right? You put something through, you shake it, and the stuff that you want comes through, and the stuff that you don't want is on the top that you can throw it away. People who pan for gold will do this and other type of things. If you want to refine paint or you want to refine flour, this is what you do. You have a filter, so the good stuff remains, and the stuff that is not helpful goes out. 
We now have a filter from the Word of God as to what we allow in our mind and what we focus on. So I want you to think this way. Think about what you think about. How do you like that, right? Wait a second. Why am I thinking of this violent act? Why am I thinking of this way to get revenge? Why am I thinking about the negative thing my spouse did? And boy, I can't believe they did that. Use this as a filter. Is what you're thinking about, is it true? Is it noble? Is it right? Is it pure? <laughs> Lovely, admirable, and the rest. If you say, God, will you help me to filter what I focus on, to reject everything that is not in line with what you tell us we should focus on, God, help me to do that. And God will help you to do that, and you'll start to see change in the landscape of your life. Whatever is true, what's that then? Let's define this a little bit closer. We live in a world filled with half-truths and deceit, do we not? Right? What did Jesus say? He says, I am the way and the what? And the life. In the way, truth, and life. Our thoughts should align with the truth found in God's Word. This is why it's important to know the truth in God's Word. You know how you combat a lie? With truth. What is the truth? Well, Jesus says he is the truth, which tells me that knowing what he says about certain things, who I am, what the future is, what he says about, what my relationship should be with other people, namely love. <laughs> if you use that as a filter and if you think about what you think about, say, wait a second, am I loving my neighbor when I'm upset about them, about their dark barking dogs. This is a personal struggle with Dave Spooner. All right. We live on an island of barking dogs everywhere around us. Now I can sit in my room where I'm trying to study and hearing the cacophony of a dog chorus going on. I can either like, mm, I wish these neighbors would, and sometimes I struggle with that. And then you yeah, have to sit myself and have a little talk with myself. Have you ever had a talk with yourself? Hey, bro, what are you doing right now? Okay. Wouldn't be better to say, boy, I am glad we are so well protected in my neighborhood. <laughs> no one's going to get away with anything because every movement is noticed. Right? Wouldn't be better to be reminded of my neighbors. And I know most of our neighbors. It's like, oh yeah, they're, they're going through a, a divorce over here. Oh yeah, that relationship is real rocky. Oh yeah, they have a um, new sixth grader that's going into school. And oh yeah, that lady is by herself and she needs some help. And God, thank you that I have neighbors that I can talk to, right? Whatever's true. God, help me to love these people. This is one of the filters God gives us, okay? Can't spend a ton of time on these, but I want us to understand what is noble and right, right? Nobility and righteousness reflect the character of God, right? I like that, right? What is a noble thought at this time? Instead of my boss is such a crank, you can say, and your boss might be a crank, Right? You can say, you know what? God, help me to make a difference to help my boss not be such a crank. And God, I pray for him or her that you would help them with whatever's happening in their home life or in their heart or in this situation. God, I ask that you would give them wisdom and give them peace. And God, help me to be an agent of peace. That's a better way 
to think and interact versus a cake going to work because I can't stand that person and I hope that they fall down a hole today, right? <laughs> I don't know what you think about, right? But you know what I'm talking about. This is where this passage points us. What is noble? What is right? Whatever is pure, right? By the way, purity is not just about avoiding sin, but actively pursuing holiness. Did you hear me here? Actively pursuing holiness. That means to be like Christ. Not just, well, I can't think that or can't look there or I can't say that, okay? The way to become more pure is to ask God to give you greater love. That's the ticket. Not focusing on what you can't do, but focusing in on what you should do. I've been thinking about a phrase for a little bit. I'm just going to throw this in. <laughs> that um, the world defines freedom as you're free to do what you desire. Okay. I think the Word of God defines freedom as the freedom to desire what is right. That's true freedom. Right? God, help us to walk in freedom, to desire what is right, what is pure. Think about whatever is lovely or admirable. Talking about the beauty and goodness in the world. Do you know that there's beauty and goodness in this world? Right? From a simple flower to a laugh of a two-year-old? To instead of looking down at the traffic and being irritated... Look up at the clouds. Have you done that? I've been doing this more lately. It's incredible. That's amazing. <laughs> there is loveliness and things to admire all around us. Choose to focus on these things. Choose to find joy and gratitude even in difficult circumstances. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy. And excellence and praiseworthiness are the pinnacle of what we should aim for in our thoughts. These are things that reflect the glory of God and inspire worship. Most of our songs in this place are focused in on the goodness and the glory of God important for us to lift our eyes, focus our eyes, because typically during the week we are just focused on the person or the situation or the obstacle or whatever is in front of us. This is why getting in the Word helps us to lift our eyes. This is why worship helps us to lift not just our voices but our eyes to focus on what matters most, what is good, what is worthy, what is excellent, what is praiseworthy. And if you focus on these things, you you will find yourself praising God. Because the truth is, you focus on what you see. Now, here's a simple and maybe silly example of this. Right? A number of years ago, we had a car that was failing, and so we had to buy another car. So I did my homework, I looked around, and I found one that's not my car, but it looks exactly like it. This is one of our cars we drive. I was like, wow, this is a really nice car. Did all this? I'm like, I've never seen this car before, right? And so I don't know anyone who drives them. I don't think anyone in Rockford drives this car, right? <laughs> you know exactly where I'm going with this, right? Once we got that car and I started to look for, well, I'm the only one driving this car. It sounds like then all of a sudden I saw that almost every third car was one of these. <laughs> How come we all bought the same car at the same time, right? Now, of course they were there, but I didn't see them because I wasn't focused on them, right? But once I started to focus on them, then I saw them everywhere. So what you focus on is what you see, and also, what you're looking for is what you will 
find. Just had a brief conversation this morning over here with Gianna about this, right? Often when I talk to students who are going off to school, I have a conversation that all of the schools look great, all the brochures are really nice, it's going to be an awesome experience regardless of where you go, right? So I'll say to students, if you go to school, when you go to school, you will find what you're looking for. That is this, that if you're going and you're looking for a party scene, right? You're looking for a handsome guy or a pretty girl or you're looking to, you know, get in trouble, you'll find it there, right? However, if you are looking to get a good education, if you're looking for uh, a way to grow in your faith, if you're looking for strong Christian friends, you'll find it there. Some places it's easier than others to find these things, but what you look for is what you will find. So what are you looking for? What are you focusing on? This week I read a story and I liked it. I'm going to share it with you all. And it's a story about a man who moved to a small village. Now on his first day to this village, he went up to one of the elders and he asked him, what are the people like in this village? And the elder wisely responded, well, what were the people like in the place you came from? <laughs> then the man replied, well, let me tell you, they were selfish, they were rude, they were unfriendly. The elder nodded and said, you'll find the people here are the same. Now, later that day, comes another person who was recently coming into this community, found this same elder and asked him, well, what are the people like in this town? And the elder, again, rightly and wisely responded, well, what were the people like in your previous town? And the person replied, oh, those people were kind and they were generous and they were welcoming. The elder smiled and said, hmm, you'll find that the people here are the same. The moral is that what we focus on often determines our experience. Okay? If we focus in on what is good and true and admirable, we will begin to see those qualities around us and in others. But if we focus on the things that aren't good, aren't right, aren't true, aren't admirable. We'll find those things everywhere as well. What are you focusing on? This will help you in your work situation. This will help you in your family. This will help you with your spouse. Right? Let's just do some group marriage counseling. Your marriage has problems because you married a sinner. Your marriage has problems because your spouse married a sinner. Right. Right. How are we to spur each other on to love and good deeds? And what are you going to focus on? If I asked you, hey, tell me some good things about your spouse, you'll say a bunch. And once you get going, you'll probably say a bunch more. Focus on these things. Focus on feeding them. Right? Pray about the things that irritate you. They may still irritate you, but that's more about you than it is about them. Right? Allow these things to help you in your relationships. And whoever is driving you crazy in your life, just take a step back. Understand that they're a child of God. Understand God is working on them as he is on you and choose to place your focus on what this passage tells us. This will transform you and its potential of transforming the relationship or even them. We are transformed by the renewal of our what? Mind, Romans 12, 2. Be transformed by the renewing of your 
mind. And you need help in this. I need help in this. Because by default, we go into a ditch. Right? But by the strength of the Spirit of God, putting a filter in what comes into the soil of our soul, amazing things can come out because of we are diligent to focus in on what Scripture tells us to focus on putting those seeds in. So I'm asking you to do some surgery on your thoughts. Pay attention to what's happening there. You need to take this passage and put it up someplace and memorize it, right? So it's equipped there. And so then pay attention to your thoughts and just pray, God, will you help me to be aware of what I'm thinking about? And God, will you help me to steer my thoughts in the right direction or pull these things out of my life and replace them, whatever is true and admirable and good and pleasant and praiseworthy, you will see some transformation. Where you focus matters. What you focus on shapes who you are, guides what you do, determines who is with you, and here's the second part of this passage, who you follow. So Paul instructs us with these things, and please think about this. Work on what's happening here. And then he couples it with this sentence. This is putting truth into action. This is the second part of verse 9. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. We're going to stop there. Okay. So what is he talking about? He's talking about the power of your examples, right? of your examples. We all need good and godly examples to follow. This is where truth comes to life. Now, all of us have examples, right? You all grew up in a home. You all grew up someplace. You all more than likely went to school, you have people around you, and you have some examples who are perhaps negative examples, and you can say, mm, I don't want to make those choices because they got that result. These are cautionary tales, and there is some good in that. But it's much better to have positive examples of people that, can, that we can follow in a positive way. Paul tells this congregation in many places, back in Philippians chapter 3, he says, hey, join together in following my example, just as you've seen as I model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. He also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Now, ultimately, if you're a Christian, we are to focus or fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, right? For the joy set before him during the cross, right? We focus in on him. And as we are focusing in on him, our life is transformed as we try to walk and look to walk as Jesus walked. Then other people can see the truth of Scripture living in our lives as well. People are following you. I'm not asking you to go get a detective. Not that type of following. <laughs> People are watching you. Your children, your spouse, your co-workers, those who are at school, wherever you are, they're watching you. Examples matter. I am glad that we have a church full of lots of different type of people and lots of different ages. If we had a church that was just full of young people, that would be a problem. <laughs> if we had church full of old people, that would be a problem. We need older people with gray hairs or no hairs. And we need younger people so that we have examples. 
I'm going to give you one uh, example, and this is one I know well. This is an example, actually, of my wife. If you can go to the next slide, please. There she is. At 16 years old, she's the one on the left, of course. <laughs> Let me tell you a story. So, uh, my wife grew up in a house that was less than all ideal. I'll just put this. Okay, she's crying. No, I'm going to start crying. <laughs> um, uh, that was less than ideal. Uh, six siblings. She was the youngest. There was lots of dysfunction and unhealth in many, many, many ways in that home. When she was around 15, um, well, before that, she, yeah, it was, it was bad. Right? She, the gospel was shared with her at a young, young age. And it, I can't look at her. <laughs> um, I'm going to go over here. Um, um, and uh, the seed of the gospel was planted in her heart, and she became alive, but she didn't know what to do, right? And so this little 16-year-old girl um, wrote a letter to a, a church she knew in town. It was a massive church. It was like 2,000 people. It was a mega church. Wrote a letter to the pastor. <laughs> Dear pastor, I'm a new Christian. Um, I need someone to mentor me. I don't know anybody that can do this. Can you help? And bless this pastor in a Sunday night service a thousand people there, whatever. At the end of the service, he read this letter from the 16-year-old girl looking for a mentor, right? At the end of the service, one lady came up. Her name is Arlene. She says, I'm that person. Give me your name, get her address. And so this is the first meeting and one of the first meetings that got this picture. And this is Arlene. And um, for the next 35 years, 35 years, Arlene was that example. This is what you do, Gretchen, when you are in a certain circumstance. This is her love. My wife's love for, love for the word came from Arlene. How my wife prays came from Arlene, watching her, being with her. How she interacts with people. She would call her up on the phone, call her up on the phone. Help me. And my wife is radically different from the rest of her siblings because of Arlene, right? A mentor. The reason why we're crying is that uh, Gretchen's going to be speaking at Arlene's funeral a week from tomorrow. And we're grateful. She's not the person she would be. Who knew that she would be married to a pastor, right? All she was was a kid from a rough background total mixed up thinking, and yet someone said, I will help. I will mentor. I will wrap my arm around this person. Right? Arlene's a normal person. She has five other kids. It wasn't like she was just sitting at home wondering what to do. She's like, I want to respond and make a difference. Be an Arlene to someone else. Be a young Gretchen or a 30-year-old Gretchen, so to speak, and asking, will you help me? Find some people in this congregation. I look around and I see godly people here. Saints, senior saints, I'll call them. They're everywhere. No. And you say, well, you know, I don't have much to offer. You do. Right? And I see younger people and middle-aged people right? who need people. Examples have power. Invest yourself into the lives of other people. People need to see the truth with skin on. God, help us to be that way. Recently, I've been talking about um, our church being like a greenhouse, and this is where the soil comes, and we're all growing. 
By the way, do you know how trees in the forest grow so big and tall? Because they lean on each other when the storms come. Their roots get interconnected and they communicate and they help and they can withstand. Forests can withstand things because they're standing by each other. Stand by someone. It's one of the main things about coming to church, right? Getting in community. This is how we develop. This is how we grow. This is how we mature. Examples matter. Reach out, build relationships. If you're older, reach out to younger. If you're younger, reach out to older and vice versa. Do it. The third and final, well, two other things. This next one is this. There's another power here. It's the power of your practice. Right. Practice. Paul says, whatever you've seen or heard or um, received from me, put it into practice. So practice has power. And you've probably heard the phrase, practice makes perfect. <laughs> you probably heard that. And it can do that. But I do know what practice will always do. Practice makes permanent. Okay. You can practice something wrongly. It's not making perfect. You can practice, I can practice a wrong golf swing, which I'm really good at that, by the way. A wrong golf swing. I go to it by default <laughs> because I've done it so long, it's now become permanent. If you go golfing with me, you'll find this out. Okay. What we practice becomes what's permanent, either good or bad. And so, practice, 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 practice to be, here's the word, godly. Makes a difference. Paul tells young Timothy in his book to him, his first book to him, says, train yourself to be godly. Now, who's responsible in that situation? Train yourself. It's not a trick question. Who's responsible? You are, right? I can help. I will help shepherd you. We have shepherds here. We call that intentional. We're leaders here. There's spiritually mature people around here can help, but you have the responsibility to Train yourself to be godly, right? Now, we understand how this works in physical training, right? You have a coach, but you ultimately have to lift the weight or run the distance or make the catch or whatever. You have to do it, but they can help coach you. We know this physically, but it's also true spiritually that we have a responsibility and an opportunity to become more like Christ. How do you do this? Just like anything, you practice. And guess what? You're going to screw it up sometimes, right? Dave has been working at being patient for a long time. Sometimes Dave is good at it. Other times, Dave needs a little more practice, right? But the more you do something, it becomes ingrained, more permanent. And when it becomes more permanent, then it comes out by default, right? Just like a quarterback. They train them and train them and train them and train them. Train them. So when they get in the game, they don't have to think about it. It's muscle memory and it happens, right? That didn't happen by accident. It happened with countless hours of work, but so it gets ingrained. Becoming godly doesn't happen by accident, Intentionality, focus, work, practice. God, help me to be kind to my coworker or my spouse. And then you practice, hey, I did it right. And then you might not do it right, you might not do it right. You might, oh, I don't want to do that. God, help me to focus on what is true. God, help me give the strength. And you did it right. 
And the more you do it, the better you'll become at it, and the more by default it'll be there. When you see godly people, they just ooze gratefulness. Where did that come from? Practice, right? Ken Sodersham, you guys know Ken over here? Hi, Ken. Ken's like, what is he saying? Okay, <laughs> this is Ken. He's my friend. Right? I've mentioned him in the past, and I'm just picking on him because I love him. Right? Ken is probably the most grateful person that I know. Every time I talk to Ken, it's like, how are you, Ken? I'm praising God. Right? Have you ever talked to Ken? Right? I'm so grateful for, and he'll come in sometimes to prayer with a big bruise on his face, and down here, Ken, what happened? I fell down, hit my head, right? This has happened a couple times, right? And he'll tell me this story, and he says, I'm so grateful to God. Right? I'm like, Ken is following Christ. Now, did Ken ever, did he start out being this grateful? Did he start out being this grateful, Ken? That's okay. My question is, did you start out being that grateful when you were a young man? He is grateful for all that God has given to me. I bet you Ken didn't start out to be a, didn't start out as a grateful kid. He learned to be that, right? You learned. I've heard his story and I know it. The point is that you become more godly by practice, right? You say, oh, I'll never be a, you know, whatever. Trust God's spirit. <laughs> get his word in your heart. Get some good examples. Get around people that will help you. Practice. And guess what? You'll become more like Christ. This is how it works. It's not rocket science. <laughs> this is what this passage is talking about here. Right? And then the promise is this. Okay. And the God of peace will be with you. This is the promise of God's presence, right? Now, I want to couple that with what Paul talked about in the preceding um, verses, right before these verses. You remember that from, from last week, right? Do not be anxious about every, anything, but in everything, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind, Christ Jesus. Remember when you said this, right? Peace of God being in your heart when we are praying to Him. Right? Now He's coupling with the peace of God being in us with the peace of God, or the, by the way, the God of peace being with us. So we can have the peace of God in our heart, and we have the, the God of peace with us when we are living out the thoughts that we are allowed to be planted in our soul, and we are living out these things as an example and as a practice. This is Mark, by the way. He's getting baptized tonight, which is a good thing. Hi, Mark. I was watching everyone watch him, so I'll just pause and say hello to Mark. And let's go back. <laughs> so the peace of God can be in your heart, and the God of peace can be with you, right? Putting these things into practice. You'll recognize the God of peace is with you when you go to work tomorrow, when you go to bed tonight, when you go to school this upcoming week. God, help me to think about these things. It's going to help you inside your soul. God, give me someone, or what would Arlene do? What would Fran do? What would Lee do? And God, help me to practice that. This will help you to become more like Christ. Right? And the God of peace will be with you. If I know something about you, you want more peace in your life. I'm just telling you. I can say that because I'm a human as well. Right? These things help us. So as we reflect on Philippians 4, and if the worship team can come back up, that would be great. As we reflect on Philippians 4, 
My hope is that we would commit ourselves to cultivating a godly mindset. I can't do this for you. You're the captain of your thought ship. You're the gardener of your soul, right? There's great seeds you can put in, and there's probably some weeds that are growing. Pay attention to what you think about. Memorize this passage. And let's be diligent in what we allow into our minds and focus on, again, true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Right? Focus on these things and your experiences will change. And I didn't say your circumstances. Your circumstance might remain the same, but your experience of your circumstance will change. You get that? This, this could be revolutionary to you. Seek, learn, follow godly examples. Find some folks. Read some books. Listen to some things. Uproot some of the weeds that are growing in your head. Right? Change. God will help you. In doing so, you'll not only experience the peace of God, but also the source of peace and blessing the God of peace, and you will become a source of peace and blessing to others. Remember that what you focus on and who you follow shapes who you are, guides what you do, and determines who is with you. May the God of peace be with us all as we strive to live to honor Him.